It's football. I've been watching it for 40 years. Are you kidding me? You're listening to Winning Cures Everything. Game day, baby. Wake up or get out. Here's your host. A confident young man. A superb athlete. Gary Seegers. Welcome in, Winning Cures Everything. It is the Wednesday, October 12th edition of the show. I am your host, Gary Seegers. You can follow me on Twitter, at GaryWCE. Hopefully everybody is ready to dive into some games that we're going to do. A little different schedule this week. Going to hit the standalone, under-the-radar pick em for week number seven in college football right now. We're going to go ahead and do it tonight on Wednesday night. Not going to be a live show with it or whatever. Uh, we'll have the normal Thursday show, but we're just going to hit no, uh, excuse me, news and notes and uh, just a, a quick preview like I typically do on the Thursday show. So uh, we're going to go ahead and hit the games. This go around. The show is powered by BetUS. It's America's favorite sports book since 1994. That's right. It's been a very, very long time, but they know what they're doing because they are where the game begins. Go check them out, BetUS. Also check out BetUS TV, BetUSTV.com. That is where the BetUS College Football Show lies, and I host that every Tuesday and Wednesday at 1 p.m. Eastern time, so make sure that you go and check that out. I uh, hosted for us to discuss, I believe, 18, 17 games, something like that this week. Uh, we did deep dives on a lot of games. So go and double-check that uh, before you ask why I didn't hit on other games. That, that would be why. So if you do have games or that, yeah, games uh, that you would like for me to discuss that you want to hit me up about that I didn't at some point this week, you can always reach out to me on Twitter. Easiest way to do it. Uh, also, go and check out Valtimary Surf Company. There's going to be a link in the description. Very easy to find. Go and check out their shirts. I'm telling you, really good quality stuff. Collegiate School towns, like the Tuscaloosa Surf Company, the Starkville Surf Company, Oxford Surf Company, all that kind of stuff, right? Uh, that's all just in this area right here. But there's also all of the other ones, Norman, Oklahoma, like the Norman Surf Company, all that kind of stuff. I know it sounds a little weird, but go and check out the shirts. Great quality products. Use the promo code GARY10, and you can get 10% off of your order. So go and check that out. All right, let's dive into game number one here. Kansas heads to Oklahoma, and Oklahoma is an eight and a half point favorite. Let's see, latest total is sixty two and a half over at BetUS. So make sure that you go and check that out uh, over at BetUS. Twelve p.m. Eastern time on ESPN two. Interesting line, right? Because you think, hmm, there's got to be something to this. But when I pulled up my numbers, I've actually got Oklahoma favored by eight point oh six. Uh, you look at some of the trends here. When it uh, the way that it goes with this team, Kansas eight zero and one against the spread in their last nine games. They are four and zero against the spread on the road. Oklahoma uh, one and four against the spread in their last five, and zero three and one against the spread in their last four against the Big Twelve. So the trends certainly seem to favor Kansas, but there is a reason why this number is the way that it is. If you look at this, one, strength of schedule, Oklahoma's played a significantly stronger schedule than Kansas has. Uh, but Oklahoma's offense, here's our biggest mismatch here. Oklahoma's running game, number 11 in PPA per rush against number 92 PPA per rush. On top of that, success rate, number 12, excuse me, number 29 in rushing success rate, Oklahoma's offense against Oklahoma's, excuse me, against Kansas's defense, number 90 in rushing success rate allowed. You go over to the other side, yeah, I think Kansas is going to be able to score some points. But once you get Dylan Gabriel back, those numbers are going to look a lot better as far as Oklahoma's passing offense, which right there, number 56 PPA per pass, they can take advantage of Kansas' defense big time. Throw on top of that the fact that you get Dylan Gabriel back, we think, and Jalen Daniels is likely going to miss this game. No, he's not out for the rest of the season, but he will likely miss this game and you have got a, a, like a real chance here. And I understand Jason Bean did amazing things, but I don't think that what he did is sustainable over multiple games, right? <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, I look at this. I mean, both teams are pretty good at average field position. When you look at turnover margin, uh, Oklahoma number 15 in giveaways per game. Kansas is number 18, so you're not really going to take advantage of uh, turnovers, you wouldn't think. And when it comes down to it, you know, Oklahoma plays significantly faster. And they've got better athletes. The more plays you have in a game when you have better athletes, the more that tends to favor the uh, the better talented team. So I, I think when I look at this, 
obviously a lot of money coming in on Kansas, and I understand that, but give me Oklahoma. I'm going to take the Sooners to cover the eight and a half here uh, because I think that without Jalen Daniels, this team is, while still creative and still really fun to watch and still probably going to put up a fight, I do think that Oklahoma is ready to get off the mat and do something. That's that's the way that I look at this. So I will take Oklahoma to cover the eight and a half here. Uh, it, that is, of course, expecting Dylan Gabriel to play this weekend. Moving right along, Miami and Virginia Tech. And this is a strange one, right? Um, fun, fun ball game, typically, but this one got relegated to like a regional sports network. It's on ESPN3. <coughs> Did not expect... Miami in their first year with Mario Cristobal and Brent Pry with his first year with Virginia Tech to end up on just a streaming platform nationally. Like, I really thought that these two teams would be a little bit better than what they are. I didn't expect big things, but my goodness. I mean, what has happened to these guys? Okay, so let's break it down. Let's go on and dive into it. Uh, As far as the trends go. Miami 4-1 and one against the spread in their last five against Virginia Tech, so that is certainly a trend to watch out for. Miami 5-2 and two against the spread in their last seven on the road. They are 0-4 against the spread in their last four overall, so obviously things are trending downward there. Virginia Tech 2-7 and seven against the spread in their last nine at home. They are also 0-4 against the spread uh, in their last four overall. It, it, not good things as far as Virginia Tech and Miami is concerned. This spread is Virginia Tech plus seven. 46.5 is the total here. My numbers love Miami in this spot. Like, absolutely love them. Minus 14.53. Um, and, and I can understand some of that, right? The biggest thing is Miami, their defense is still really good against the run. And as far as the passing game is concerned, like their passing success rate, number 65, uh, their PBA per pass, not great, right? And a big part of that is passing explosiveness, which it looks like Virginia Tech might be able to take advantage of a little bit, but you can't do that consistently, uh, especially not with Grant Wells at quarterback. So I'm I'm hesitant to lean that direction. As far as Miami's offense, they're not great, obviously. Number 86 PPA per pass, uh, number 78 PPA per rush. But you look at the rushing success rate, Uh, there are ways that they can take advantage of what Virginia Tech is doing. Uh, Also throw in, when you look at turnover margin, that certainly favors uh, Miami over Virginia Tech. And penalties per game favors Miami over Virginia Tech as well. I I think, you know, you're talking about points per game is pretty good. Uh, I I think that I'm going to have to go with Miami in the spot. I think that Tyler Van Dyke gets right. I think that there are ways that... They can score, and Virginia Tech is just not going to be able to. I just don't see how they'll be able to score other than through explosive plays, and you're basically taking a risk every time you do that. So I will ride with Miami uh, as the favorite to cover seven on the road, and, of course, we're starting off with two. uh, (laughs) We're starting off with two favorites, just like last week. Uh, By the way, season record is 37-35, and Uh, went five and seven on the picks last week. So these are not my best bets. My best bets are always over at BetUS, uh, the BetUS College Football Show. So go and check that out if you would. Next on the board, Arkansas heads to BYU, and BYU is a one point underdog, total of sixty six and a half. Latest number, of course, over at BetUS, three thirty p.m. Eastern Time on ESPN. This should be a fun, fun matchup. Let's go on and pull up the screen here. The trends on it, Arkansas 0-4 against the spread in their last four overall. Uh, They are 5-2 against the spread in the last seven uh, against non-conference teams, however. KJ Jefferson looks like he is going to play, so everything looks good there. Jaron Hall banged up, but he is expected to play as well on Saturday. So you got both teams just like you would expect them to be. Uh, This line did move through zero. Arkansas was a three-point underdog when it appeared that KJ Jefferson would not play. As soon as he was announced, it moved back over to Arkansas as a one-point favorite. So it has moved uh, four points in some places, four and a half points, but over about U.S. just four. BYU one and seven against the spread their last eight against the SEC. They are 0-4 against the spread in their last four overall. When you look at the numbers here, my numbers love BYU. 
really, really like BYU, especially at home in this spot. Uh, I've got them favored by nearly a touchdown. And, yes, I understand that they're a little bit banged up. I understand that the defense is not great. But PPA per pass, number 27, uh, they have found ways to be, uh, even without their best playmakers, they have found ways to be successful in the passing game. They're really good at havoc rate allowed. They don't allow a lot of havoc. So the offensive line, pretty good at pass blocking, even if they're not great at run blocking. Uh, big thing here, standard downs PPA. BYU is number 22 in the country. Arkansas's defense is number 77. Uh, if you are able to stay ahead of the chains, then I like BYU's chances here, and it certainly looks like it, it favors that. Uh, also, BYU field position advantage, big time as far as the offense goes. On defense, BYU not great at field position. I mean, obviously, number 130 in the country. Uh, but it's not like Arkansas is real good. On offense, they're number 124 in average field position on offense, so they're not winning that battle either. Uh, the thing that does scare me about this, uh, Arkansas's rush rate is 63%, right? So Kendall Bryles really, really running the ball a lot. It's number five in the country. When you look at their rushing success rate, it's number 22 in the country. Now, here's the vast difference. They're number 22 in success rate, but number 96 in PPA per rush, so they're not really generating a ton of points off of it. If they can generate points, they can certainly take advantage of this BYU defense, which is number 99 in PPA per rush. So while it looks like you've got something that would favor Arkansas here, it may not actually favor them very much at all. Uh, Arkansas's offense, not great as far as passing the football, but they are number 19 in PPA per pass, even if they're number 74 in passing success rate. That typically means that you had a fairly explosive offense that you're able to generate points even though you're not doing a whole lot throwing the football anyway. Uh, passing explosiveness, Arkansas is number 60, and uh, BYU is number 96 in that regard. So uh, when I look at these numbers, um, Puka Nakua being back, Gunnar Romney, uh, you, you got you got options there. And I really like what BYU has as far as skill position, guys. I think they're going to be able to take advantage of Arkansas's defense. Arkansas is trending in the wrong direction. Even with K.J. Jefferson back, I don't think this defense is going to be able to stop BYU. And BYU at home is a different beast. I will take BYU as the home dog. So there we go. We finally got us. We finally got us a home underdog here. Uh, but I'm going to take BYU to cover the one. My numbers really like them. I understand it. I get it. So we will move along. <coughs> Maryland heads to Indiana. Going over to Bloomington. Indiana is an 11.5 point home dog here. Total of 62 over at BetUS. 3.30 p.m. Eastern Time on ESPN2. Maryland 2 and 5 against the spread against Indiana in the last seven meetings. That's nuts. Absolutely nuts. Uh, I, I would not have believed that if I didn't read it with my own, my own two eyes. Maryland 4 and 0 against the spread uh, in their last four on the road. And let's go ahead and pull it up on the screen so that you can be looking at the numbers. Um, but Maryland, 4-1 and one against the spread in their last five overall. This season has been pretty good. This looks like a pretty stout defense. The offense, not quite as explosive as we assumed, but regardless, the defense has uh, certainly surprised. Indiana, 3-9 and nine against the spread their last 12 Big Ten games. Uh, not good. That's uh, against the number for sure. Indiana, 3-13 and 13 against the spread in their last 16 games overall. Putrid, just absolutely awful. Uh, you look at strength of record, you look at strength of schedule, and then you start seeing uh, on this sheet, the green is good and the red is bad, of course. So when you look at this, uh, I, I tend to lean Maryland ever so slightly, even on the road. Uh, I don't like what what Indiana is doing. Uh, plays per game, Indiana is number three in the country. Maryland has been playing a lot slower. If you can slow down Indiana, I think you can really, really make them confused, right? They're able to generate some plays because they generate so many plays, right? Uh, their number 110 in PPA per pass is Indiana. They are number 107 in passing success rate, number 94 PPA per rush, number 116 in rushing success rate. And if you look over on Maryland's side, they are really good on defense at all of that. So I look at this and the, uh, so basically Indiana throws the football a lot. They're number three in the country, 65.39% of the time. 
I I fully expect that Maryland, who is used to defending the pass because people throw the ball 56% of the time on them, that's number 110 in the country, uh, I think that Maryland is going to be able to slow this team down. And when you look at the offense, uh, no, they're not going to be able to run the football, but they only run the football at like a 44% clip. So their offense, as far as the passing game is concerned, I think is going to be able to do some big things here. They're number uh, 30 in passing explosiveness. Um, and Indiana's defense is number 41 in passing explosiveness allowed. So they're pretty even there. But when you look at the defense overall, number 114 in PPA per pass, and Maryland is number 41 on offense on that, I think that you can find big-time advantages for Maryland here. Uh, points per scoring opportunity. All that kind of stuff. It all leans Maryland. So, <coughs> I am... I'm going to ride with the Terps here. Uh, I know that I'm going with another road dog, or road favorite, excuse me. But I like Maryland. I think this team's really good. <coughs> this is part of the reason why we are going uh, with the show this evening. is <laughs> because... I don't know that I'm going to have a voice tomorrow. So we got to make sure that we get this thing knocked out. But, yeah, I like Maryland. I like what they're doing. Um, yeah, I, I don't like Indiana. I feel like Indiana is trending downward, even if they had a good first half against uh, Michigan. Uh, it feels like a letdown spot for them. I know that Maryland's coming off of the loss to Purdue. Still think Maryland's a better football team. All right. We'll move along from there. We've got a few more to hit on, of course. Vanderbilt at Georgia. And this one should be a lot of fun uh, for Georgia fans, I would imagine, <laughs> when you really think about it. Uh, going to pull it up on the screen while I read off the trends here. And Georgia is a 38-point favorite at home, total of 58.5 over at BetUS. 3.30 p.m. Eastern time on SEC Network. Vandy is 0-4 against the spread in their last four against Georgia, even though those numbers have been gigantic every time. Vandy, however, 5-1 and against the spread in their last six on the road. And Georgia, 2-5 and against the spread in their last seven home games. So the numbers are starting to get a little bit too high for Georgia to be able to cover. And Vandy has started to outperform those really big numbers, even though they did uh, not cover last week against Ole Miss. Now, let's break this thing down. Georgia, I, My numbers have Georgia by almost 35. Now, I know that you realize that that is not 38. So that is certainly, uh, certainly not quite. To the, to the right number. Vanderbilt's defense is uh, not good as far as throwing the football. So I would imagine that those Georgia tight ends have a pretty big day. There's not a lot to break down here, it, to be completely honest. Uh, Vandy's offense is okay, but they are not going to be able to compete with Georgia's defense. What you're really doing here is playing psychologist. Does Georgia care at all about this matchup? And I don't know the answer to that, right? Um Every game for Vanderbilt is basically the same. Like, you know that you don't have the talent to compete, so you're just trying to show up and and maybe... Like, if you're going to make a game your Super Bowl, I don't imagine it would be this one if you're Vanderbilt, right? Because the chances of you winning this, even if you do play your best game and their worst game, is slim to none. So why would you waste it on this? Uh, but when you look at the fact that Georgia has an off week next week, they might want to get right or or... They might not care at all. They might just show up and who cares? We're going to go to the bye week next week. We'll figure out whatever's been you know, troubling us. It's not like Georgia played really well against, um, against Auburn last week. They still got the cover. But at least in that one, you had a little more that you cared about, right? At Georgia... I mean, they just shellacked Vanderbilt last year. I mean, they were up 35 to nothing at the end of the first quarter. In a game like this, I would recommend not betting it, but if you want to bet it, I, the only play that you can make is Georgia, really. Like, I, I know that A.J. Swan has been doing great things. Uh, Vanderbilt's offense is number 45 PPA per pass, but you do that up against Georgia's defense, and it's not going to go well. Georgia's defense, number 11 in PPA per pass, number 14 in passing success rate allowed, uh, other than that, I don't, I don't see any kind of advantage that Vanderbilt can take advantage of. I just, I see nothing here. 
So the only thing that you can really do is bet Georgia and just hope that they feel like coming out to play. Um, and that's that's the issue with this, right? Is you're playing psychologist to you know a bunch of eighteen to twenty one year olds, like it, who knows, or eighteen to twenty two, whatever it is. Uh, so yeah, I'll, I'll take Georgia minus the thirty eight, but I don't feel great about it because I mean this this team has not exactly played well as of late. But yeah, give me Georgia to cover thirty eight here. Uh, Wisconsin and Michigan. Excuse me, Wisconsin and Michigan State. This one, of course, in East Lansing. It's 4 p.m. Eastern time on Fox. And I look at this, and I see something interesting. I see a hook here. Michigan State plus 7.5 is the latest number over at BetUS. The total sits at 49.5. The underdog between these two is 5-1 and one against the spread in the last six. Uh, in their in their matchup between the two, Wisconsin five and one against the spread against losing teams, uh, but they are zero and four against the spread after a straight up win, which is what they got against Northwestern last week. Michigan State seven two and two against the spread at home in their last let's see eleven, but they are zero and four against the spread in their last four overall. They have not been playing well thus far this season. Schedule has a little bit to do with that. Now, of course, you bring Wisconsin into East Lansing. And my numbers here have got Wisconsin favored by 8.24, which is right on that number. Um, my total on this is lower. So I'm 40.15. It's what, Don't pay attention to my totals. That's probably not where you're going to get your best stuff because the totals have not performed well. Um, but regardless, uh, the number, the actual spreads have done pretty well this year. So, we look at this. Jim Leonard, of course, is the new interim head coach. Things are looking good as far as he is concerned, especially with a whomping of Northwestern last week, but this is not Northwestern that they were playing. Michigan State's defense is pretty putrid. Um, Number 122 in PPA per pass, uh, but they're number 130, excuse me, number 30 in PPA per rush on defense. So, Wisconsin is going to have to be asked to throw the football to cover this game. I don't know that I like that. Like, Graham Mertz is is pretty good. Uh, you look at uh, look at turnover margin, and Wisconsin is number 77 in giveaways per game. Michigan State's number 74 in takeaways per game. Michigan State's defense was much better at getting interceptions last year. That is one way that you can take advantage of this game is for Michigan State to create turnovers. Uh, I don't know if they'll be able to do that. Michigan State, by the way, number 29 in penalties per game. That's pretty good. Wisconsin, number 87. So there is an advantage there for that. I, With the way that Michigan State has been trending, I could understand people wanting to take Wisconsin. But this is still not a great Wisconsin team, right? You look at at Michigan State's offense. They're not great at running the football. But there's ways that they could score on on Wisconsin's defense. Like it's this is not a a vintage uh, Jim Leonard defense. This is not Dave Aranda back there. This is they don't have the dudes right now to really do what it is that Leonard wants to do, especially in the secondary. So if you're Peyton Thorne, yeah, I know that you're number ninety in passing success rate, but you're number fifty three in passing explosiveness. And so long as you got Reed back there, I mean, you've got a chance to really create something. I, while my number says minus 8.24, I'm going to go Michigan State here. I especially love that I've got the hook on this uh, because I, I think that Michigan State can keep this thing pretty close. Uh, so give me Michigan State plus 7.5. All right, let's, uh, let's dive out of here. Let's hit some ads. And on the other side, we got Arizona at Washington. Let's check out some things you should know about. College football is back, and BetUS TV has you covered. Every Tuesday and Wednesday at 1 p.m. Eastern, we've got expert game analysis to help you make informed decisions before kickoff, only on the BetUS TV College Football Channel. Visit winningcureseverything.com to find everything you need to know about us, including full shows in video or podcast form, gambling picks, merch, the gear we use, and more. If you want more content from me, Gary, visit BetUSTV.com. I host the How to Gamble on Sports Show and, from August through January, the BetUS College Football Show. You can subscribe to both on YouTube. 
If you haven't already, subscribe to the podcast on Apple, Spotify, or whatever's your favorite podcast app. And if your app allows it, leave a five-star written review. Visit the Winning Cures Everything web store to get all kinds of football shirts, hats, hoodies, mugs, and more. Visit winningcureseverything.com slash store to see what all we've added. And now, back to the show. All right, let's get back into it. Arizona heads to Washington on Saturday evening. And Washington is currently a 14-and-a-half point favorite. Total sits at 73. That's right, it opened at 71 at some places, 71-and-a-half at BetUS. It's all the way up to 73 now, 5.30 p.m. Eastern time on the Pac-12 network. Going to pull up the numbers here while I read off the trends. Arizona is 0-5 against the spread. Their last five trips to Seattle. Arizona 1-4 against the spread against winning teams. They are 9-25 against the spread in their last 34 road games. Things have not gone well. This is a better team this year, uh, but still got some issues on defense. Uh, still not covering well against winning teams. I mean, we saw that against Oregon last week. Washington 4-0 against the spread at home. They are 1-4 against the spread against Pac-12 competition. So let's uh, let's dive into the numbers. Let's see what this thing says. Uh, Washington minus 18.59. As I said, don't pay attention to that projected total. I need to work on the formula. But as far as the spread goes, the spread is what you need to focus on here. Um, the, air, the defense for Arizona is just atrocious. Uh, Washington should be able to take advantage of just about anything that they want to. Washington not super explosive on pa- as far as passing the football. But man... Uh, and that's one thing that Arizona does defend well is, you know, it passing explosiveness. But here's the deal. You don't have to go for deep shots against this defense because if you look at it, one, Arizona cannot create havoc. They're number 122 at doing that. Washington is number five on offense. I mean, just ridiculous. Washington is number nine as far as passing success rate. Arizona's defense is number 122. Uh, when you just look over at overall efficiency, PPA per pass, Washington number 22, Arizona number 112. When you look at running the football, Washington, who doesn't do it that often, they only run the ball like 39% of the time, they're still number 27 in PPA per rush, number 41 in rushing success rate. Uh, Arizona is bottom five in the country in both of those on defense. They are not great at stopping that. As far as the offense goes, yeah, Arizona's got a chance to maybe stay in this game somewhat because they are able to throw the football. They throw it at a 50, uh, 57% clip, and when you look at the stats, I mean, number 28 PPA per pass, number 14 passing success rate, Washington's defense is really bad, and part of that has to do with some cornerbacks being dinged up, et cetera. The other part of this is they're just not good at it, right? And so so I'm, I'm curious to see which way we go on this. Um, the turnover margin certainly – leans towards Washington. Um, look at penalties per game. That tends to lean more towards Arizona. And so the intangibles, uh, those seem to lean more to Washington here. My number says closer to uh, closer to 19, like 18 and a half. This thing's only 14 and a half. Yeah, give me Washington. Give me, give me the Huskies at home to cover the 14 and a half. Uh, I think that they will be able to do some pretty big things against that Arizona defense, and I think they can do it more consistently than the Arizona offense will be able to as well. All right, moving along. Mississippi State at Kentucky. That's right, Lexington, night game, a lot of fun. Looks like Will Levis is going to play now. Uh, This line is currently sitting at four. (coughs) Excuse me, excuse me. Um, So... At 7.30 p.m. Eastern Time, SEC Network, Kentucky is a four-point underdog at home to Mississippi State. Let's go on and pull up the numbers. And that's not the right one. There we go. Okay, so uh, it was all the way up to eight and a half at some spots. It has dropped all the way to four. A lot of line movement based on the fact that Will Levis uh, could play, right? It, like they, they anticipate him playing. Uh, looking at the trends, the home team in this matchup is 8-0 and against the spread in the last eight. Mississippi State 6-1 and against the spread against winning teams in their last seven. They are 5-2 and against the spread uh, in their last seven on the road. Kentucky 0-4 against the spread after a straight-up loss. They lost to South Carolina last week. However, they are 19-5-2 against the spread against winning teams. 
That is insane. Last 26 games, they've covered 19 of them, and they've uh, pushed two of them. So what do the numbers tell us? Looking at this, number 21 PPA per pass on offense for Kentucky. Well, it turns out that Mississippi State can defend that pretty well, and they do it a lot. They they have to defend 57% passes uh, from, from opposing teams, partly because the other team is in a hole because Mississippi State has gotten into some pretty big leads here. But the defensive passing game for Mississippi State is really, really good. Uh, they're number 25 in passing success rate. They're number 15 in PPA per pass. In Kentucky, 21 in PPA per pass on offense, 26 in PPA per pass success rate. Uh, that that looks like it, if you're Kentucky, you're going to try and do something else to maybe get that secondary off of your guys a little bit. Um, but Zach Arnett is doing a fantastic job with this defense. Uh, Kentucky's offensive line is pretty good. Uh, okay. That's a lie. They're number 92 in Havoc rate allowed. They're number 98 in stuff rate allowed. They're number uh, uh, 78 in offensive line yards in the running game. Like, they cannot run the football. They're, they're just not good at that. Um, on top of that, it, as far as the defense goes for Kentucky, they're pretty good. There's a lot of things to like about this Kentucky defense. Uh, they're number 19 PPA per pass allowed. Uh, Mississippi State. Throws the ball a ton, doesn't matter because Kentucky has defended a ton of passes. Um, I think that, boy, this is a strange one. This is really a strange one. Uh, the Kentucky defense, I think, can keep them in the ball game. Uh, the biggest issue here is Kentucky, I think, is more likely to turn the football over than Mississippi State is. This looks like a different level of Mississippi State team than we are used to. Uh Will Levis, even if he comes back in this game, is going to have problems. Like, he is still not 100%. I look at this. Uh, field position favors Mississippi State. Um, yeah, there's there's a lot to like here as far as state is concerned. Turnover margin. Uh, penalties per game certainly favors Kentucky. Uh, but, you know, state is, gets aggressive on defense. Sometimes that actually helps. Sometimes those penalties are okay. I'm going to lean state here, especially now that this number has has come all the way back down to four. Uh, I didn't like it so much at eight and a half, obviously, because I mean you see, uh, mine is my number's nearly six in favor of state. I'm going to take Mississippi State to cover the four. I uh, I think they're I think they're a really really good football team. I don't think it necessarily matters that Will Levis is going to be back at quarterback because he still makes mistakes too. So, give me the Bulldogs to cover on the road at Kentucky there. Moving right along, and we have got a Big Ten battle. Nebraska at Purdue. Purdue is a 14-point favorite. Uh, Total sits at 58.5. Of course, these numbers over at BetUS currently. Um, 7.30 p.m. Eastern time on the Big Ten Network. And let's go on and pull it up. Let's pull up the stats while I pull up the trends. And Nebraska, 2-5-1 and one against the spread in their last eight against Purdue. That's definitely not good. Nebraska, 1-6 and six against the spread in their last seven. Purdue, 4-1 and one against the spread in their last five conference games. There's not a lot of trends as far as Purdue goes. Uh, this number is 14. And Nebraska has not exactly played well, but Mickey Joseph has them uh, looking better than they did, for sure. Uh, my number on this which you can see on the screen, is Purdue minus three. Which is a little surprising. But I dove into it, and it's it's not like Purdue's offense is great. Now, they've played a really strong strength of schedule, and Nebraska has not. And I don't know that that necessarily matters. But <coughs> uh, we have got, let's see, PPA per rush. Uh, it still favors Purdue, number 83 to number 110 for Nebraska's defense. Uh, the passing game is where this thing could get sideways, right? Uh, passing success rate, number 52 for Purdue's offense. It's number 86 for Nebraska's defense. That's where it could get a little squirrely. And, and the Purdue defense is really good, especially against the run, which Nebraska does at a 52.5% clip. Um, I think when I look at it, even though my number is like really low on this, the – and this is opponent-adjusted. I'm a little surprised. Um, 
you know, screw it. I'm still going to go Purdue here. Uh, I think that Purdue needs one of these big wins where they can just kind of ride it out. Uh, it wouldn't surprise me, though, to see that. You know what? Screw it. Nope. I'm going to go Nebraska. <laughs> I'm going to go Nebraska plus the 14 here because I think that this is a prime spot for Nebraska to care about a ball game more than Purdue does, right? Purdue has bigger ambitions than this one. Uh, as a matter of fact, I'm going to look and see exactly who they play next. But I, I see this, and I think, you know, Nebraska really, really wants to stay in every game, et cetera. Purdue still has Aiden O'Connell banged up. Um, let's see. Da, 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 da. Yeah, Purdue's got at, at Wisconsin next week. So Nebraska, on the other hand, has an off week. Uh, this seems like a good spot. I, I don't think Nebraska's going to win the game, but I do think that they can they can stay within 14. That's what I'm going to do. Uh, that's, I, like, I like Purdue to win this game. I don't think that they're going to do like an a A-plus effort here. So give me... Give me Nebraska to cover 14. I just think it's too many points here because I do think that Nebraska can find something on offense and and be able to do at least a little something against that Purdue defense. Um, and then later, I mean, if it comes down to it, uh, you kind of be banking on a backdoor cover a little bit. But, eh, you know, you don't like to do that typically. But, hey, these are not my best bets. Those you can find over at the BetUS TV College Football Show. So go and check that out. Moving right along, the Memphis Tigers head to East Carolina. East Carolina is a four and a half point favorite. Total sits at 58 over at BetUS. So make sure that you go and check that out. 7 30 p.m. Eastern Time on ESPNU. And let's go on and pull up the stats, of course, while I tell you the trends. And they don't look good for the Tigers, okay? Trends are certainly not in their favor. Memphis one and six against the spread at East Carolina. Their last seven trips out there, they are two and twelve against the spread in their last 14 meetings with the Pirates. So definitely eh, uh, not good. Memphis is 2-7 and seven against the spread in their last nine overall. East Carolina 6-0-1 oh, against the spread after a straight-up loss. Of course, they lost at Tulane last week. Um, and they are 6-2 and two against the spread at home in their last eight. Memphis, of course, coming off of the heartbreaking, just disgusting fourth quarter where they lost the game to Houston after they were up 26 to 7 ended up losing 33 to 32. The numbers still like Memphis in this spot, okay? Um I their defense is not great against the pass and that's one place where Holton Aylers could certainly take advantage of them. Uh passing success rate, the Tigers defense number 111 in that spot, number 95 in PPA per pass defense. East Carolina, that's what they do best. Number 55 in PPA per pass, they're number 39 in passing success rate on offense. Uh, you're not going to see a bunch of explosive plays as far as the passing game is concerned, but where I would be worried is this Tigers running game. Uh, excuse me, the Tigers rushing defense. Number 70 in rushing explosiveness allowed. East Carolina is number 8. So even though they're not super successful with it, uh, number 92 in the country, uh, that is something that East Carolina can do on offense to take advantage. On the other side, when Memphis has the football, uh, they also can take advantage as far as the passing game is concerned. Number 67 in PPA per pass. And the East Carolina defense is number 92 here. So there's there's certainly ways. Oh, and passing explosiveness, by the way. Uh, passing explosive play rate. That heavily leans Memphis's way. Number 31 in that metric. East Carolina's defense, number 93 in that allowed. Uh, the rushing defense for East Carolina is awesome. Like, really good. Number 10, PPA per rush. Number 5, rushing success rate allowed. Here is the issue is number 84 in rushing explosiveness allowed. So there are ways that Memphis might could break off a couple of runs here and there, but you're not going to run the ball enough to maybe have one of those. Uh, Looking at turnover margin, that favors Memphis big time. The penalties per game, both of them really, really good. Number 20 and number 24. Uh, Field position, you know, tends to lean uh, East Carolina a little bit. But I, I look at this, and I just think four and a half is too many. Uh, I know that Memphis is only one and six in, against the spread in their last seven at East Carolina. I understand that Memphis is two and 12 against the spread in their last 14 against East Carolina. Four and a half feels like too many. Uh, I think Memphis can find ways to take advantage of them. 
Uh, I will take Memphis to cover the four and a half. So there we go with another dog. Look at this. I'm actually taking dogs this week. So, yes, Memphis plus four and a half on the road at East Carolina. I understand they're one and ten against the spread in their last seven on the road. Uh, excuse me, last 11 on the road. But they did cover this year at Navy. They typically don't do that. So, there you go. We got two more to hit. Let's go on and knock it out. Stanford at Notre Dame. Going to pull up the stats here so you can see what we're looking at. Notre Dame is a 17-point favorite. Total of 53.5. Of course, the number's over at BetUS. 7.30 p.m. Eastern Time on NBC. Stanford 2-6 and six against the spread. Their last eight meetings against Notre Dame. That ain't good. Stanford 0-5 oh against the spread. Their last five on the road. They are 1-7 against the spread. Their last eight against winning teams. And Notre Dame, all the spread stuff certainly looks good for them. They are 10-3 against the spread. Their last 13, 7-2 against the spread uh, after a spread win. All of these things... Look good for Notre Dame. However, that number has gotten all the way out to 17. So let's break it down. My number is actually closer to 12 in this matchup. Uh, Notre Dame's, look, the PPA margin, number 76 against number 104. Here is what I don't like about Stanford. Since EJ Smith went out, this team has just been, uh, what's the word? Dreadful? Would dreadful be a good word here? Uh, Yeah, I I think they're pretty bad. I think they're pretty bad. Uh, Stanford has not done well on the road. They have lost 11 consecutive games to P5 competition. Um, it, what what you've got to find is a way to take advantage of Notre Dame's defense. And I don't see where Stanford can do that. I know Stanford is trying to run this new slow mesh thing that they got from Wake Forest, etc. But And it worked really well with EJ Smith. Right, You saw it work against USC. You saw it work in the first game of the year. Now EJ Smith is out for the season. Um, I think if you're going to do anything, you got to find a way to get Tanner McKee to hit some explosive plays down the field. That's just about the only way you'll be able to do it. Mm-hmm. Notre Dame's defense is number 105 in passing explosiveness allowed. Stanford is number 26 in that spot. Uh, this Notre Dame defense is not great. Like they're, they're just not. When you look at the numbers, they're, they're not a good fantastic defense, right? Um, in Stanford, while they're not a good team at all, uh, I fully expect that Notre Dame will run the football, not necessarily at will, but they'll be able to run the football on them, to say to say the least. Uh, I think that's the biggest thing for me. If this number was like two touchdowns, I might feel better about Notre Dame, maybe, even though my number is even lower than that. Uh, man, Stanford is so bad. They're so bad. If they can, I think I trust Marcus Freeman's defense more than what these numbers show. I don't think Stanford's very good. I think Notre Dame is going to uh, try and make themselves feel pretty good about this one. They just went out to Vegas, uh, gave up a a really big lead in that one, and BYU made it more of a game than they probably probably should have. Uh, I will take Notre Dame to cover the 17 here. I know that my numbers don't say it, but, hey, I disagree with the numbers sometimes. That's the way it goes. Like, these things are not supposed to be end-all, be-alls. They are supposed to give you a little bit of insight, just a an idea of what we're looking at when you get into these games. So give me Notre Dame to cover the 17 at home on Saturday night against a bad, bad Stanford football team. All right, moving right along. we got one more to go. Let me write down the time here. Let's see. North Carolina, Uh, yes, North Carolina and Duke. Duke is a seven-point underdog at home. The total sits at 67. It's 8 p.m. Eastern time on the ACC network on this one. And my numbers say North Carolina to cover by, or not to cover, but North Carolina by about eight points, 7.78 points. And here is the reason why I think they will be able to take advantage of Duke. Duke does not run the ball a lot, right? I say that. I mean, it's still 49% of the time. It's number 64 in the country. Their PPA per rush is number 20, and their uh, rushing success rate is number 12. But they're not exactly super explosive with it. 
you just have to continue going down the field and hope that they can score, they can get, you know, four or five yards every single time they run the football against North Carolina. On the other side, this offense for North Carolina, they have a massive advantage over Duke's defense. Uh, Duke's PPA per pass is number 103. Their passing success rate is number 88. Their passing explosiveness allowed is number 60. Josh Downs and that bunch are going to be able to get down the field. They will be able to take the top off of this defense. Um, looking at the trends on this, I didn't even go through the trends. Excuse me. North Carolina 4-0 and against the spread in their last four meetings against Duke. Uh, North Carolina 4-1 and against the spread in their last five games overall. They are 4-1 and against the spread in their last five games on the road. Uh, Duke, however, 1-8 and against the number against winning teams. That is not good. That is not good. And you just saw Duke get beat by Georgia Tech. So that ain't cool. Uh, I look at this, and yeah, Duke has got an advantage on field position, et cetera. I don't think it's necessarily going to matter. Points per scoring opportunity, that goes towards North Carolina, uh, really on both sides, uh, because Duke is only number 100 on offense in points per scoring opportunity. If if Duke cannot finish drives, this thing could get ugly quick. I, I am going to roll with North Carolina here. I think that this should be closer to you know, probably 10 points as opposed to the 7.78 that I've got it. And I think that Duke is going to come back down to earth a little bit once they go up against, uh, I'll, I'll say, more talent, right? Because they haven't really played a team that's got the kind of talent that North Carolina's got. I think North Carolina could just out-athlete them. And Duke's offense with Riley Leonard is still pretty good. They've got dudes, and and I like what Mike Elko's doing on defense, but he doesn't have the guys in the secondary yet to really be able to keep up with what Phil Longo's doing on the offense for North Carolina. So I'm going to take North Carolina to cover, even on the road, as a seven-point favorite. Um, but that's that's the way that that goes. I, I just Duke isn't there yet. I like what they're doing, but they ain't quite there yet. I'll, I'll say that. So I, I expect North Carolina to be able to cover cover this pretty easily. All right, that is going to wrap it up for the college football pick them under the radar against the spread, whatever you want to call it, right? Uh, my my picks for the week that were not as a part of the Bet US show. I am struggling to get through this. <laughs> so I hope that you guys bear with me this week. It has been a long week. I am uh, I am tired. I am exhausted and a little bit sick. But hey, we're going to make this thing happen regardless, right? So Let's go on and get out of here. Go to BetUS, go to BetUSTV.com, go and check out all of that. It's America's favorite sports book since 1984, 1994, whatever it is. You know I should know all this stuff. And my, my brain is playing tricks on me. All right, let's get out of here. Um, go to all the links in the description. That's the easiest way to do this. And if you have any questions, et cetera, just reach out to me on Twitter, at GaryWCE. All right, let's do this. You guys take care of yourself, take care of each other, and hopefully, hopefully, all your tickets cash this weekend. Thanks for listening to Winning Cures Everything. Make sure and subscribe on YouTube or your favorite podcast app, and make sure to leave a nice five-star review. You can follow Gary on Twitter, at GaryWCE, and the show is at Winning Cures. Be sure to check out the merch in our web store and share the show.